Embers are blowing at the house. The embers build up at the base of the wall. This side has five feet of bark mulch right up against the side of the house. The other side uses a gravel mulch just in the area closest to the home. Uses a different deck construction with wider gaps between the deck boards. This is all required in California if you build a new home today in the wildland urban interface. It's been required since 2008. These are, these are some of the features. I know you can't read this necessarily, but we look at the eaves, the vents, the windows, dual pane tempered glass windows, the mulch around the exterior of the house and the construction of the deck and features that are attached to the house. The building code's a little more in depth than that, but those are some of the most vulnerable features that we can engineer. We can build our homes just a little bit differently. It still looks like a traditional home, any architectural style you want, but it will withstand a wildfire. How well will it withstand a wildfire during the campfire 2018? This, right? this is not even 18 months ago. During the campfire, 12,450 homes were destroyed. Almost 20,000 structures, including commercial structures, government buildings. But if your home was built after 2008, 51% of those homes survived. Um, if it was built before 2008, 16 to 18% of the homes survived. That year, it's a magic year. That was the year that building code was adopted. Homes built after 2008 had better than even odds of surviving. Even in the campfire, the most destructive urban wildland conflagration we've ever seen in the United States. Um, I, I just I throw this in two seconds, but, but there was a lot of concern when this building code was adopted in 2008. The building industry in particular was terrified that this was going to drive the cost of building up. They told us that nobody's ever going to build another home in California. It's going to be too expensive. That, that, they, we knew that was nuts. It took a little while to convince them. The uh, Headwaters Economics, where Dr. Steve Quarles is actually a board member there as well, authored this study. They found that, that the cost of building a home to California's current standard, at least in their test case, was actually a little less than building the traditional way. The materials are more durable. Um, there were actually some cost savings, but for the most part, it's roughly the same cost to build a home that will withstand a wildfire and one that won't. So, that's the background. I'm going to go through very quickly through a handful of things that you can do to protect your home that are probably in many ways more valuable than the vegetation that you've been, been so concerned about. It's not to minimize that, and Greg's going to talk a lot about what the things you can do in your landscape, but I want to focus on the most important things you can do to protect your home from those embers, the 60 to 90 percent of home ignitions. You need to start at your roof. You need to focus on your roof. You need to focus on on uh, the big flat surface that tends to attract and catch embers that are falling from the sky during a wildfire. You need to be looking at the valleys of the roof, the rain gutters that are attached to your roof. Um, it was, we, we don't see many wood shingled or shaped roofs in, uh, in Marin anymore because they've essentially been outlawed since uh, the early 1990s. Following the Oakland Hills fire, we adopted what the requirement that requires Class A roofs. Class A roofs that you can see an example of uh, a Class A roof outside in our display. They're roofs that are just designed to withstand embers and material actually igniting on the roof um, during a wildfire that won't burn through and ignite the whole house, at least for a period of time. Clearing leaves and needles, keeping your, rent, your roof clean is the best thing you can do to protect your home, bar none. You've got to start your roof, focus on your roof, covering your rain gutters, important to keep material from building up that you won't be able to see from down below. You need to pay close attention to areas that tend to collect leaves and, and material that fall on your roof, but especially places where there's a vertical surface like a wall. This might be a dormer, depending on, on your roof construction. Some roofs have no vertical surfaces. Other ones have one like this, a dormer that meets your roof. This is a twofer here, or you're gonna see another twofer in a second, where, where we've got a, kind of this hidden valley behind here that collects a lot of leaf litter. This is vulnerability. I would have zero expectation that this house would survive any kind of a wildfire in its proximity. Um, uh, the way to fix that, clean that roof. Keep it spotlessly clean during the fire season, and even better, Replace the siding here. We've got wood shingle siding mm -hmm. right down to the surface of the roof. There's going to come a time in the fall where you can't keep up with the leaves that are falling on your roof. Replacing the wood shingles here with cement fiber shingles that look identical, that are actually longer lasting. Maybe James Hardy products and some other manufacturers make fiber cement shingles. Your direct replacement for the wood shingles on your house. 
just replacing the shingles on the dormer might be one of the best things that this person can do to protect their home during a wildfire. <clears throat> Your vents, the vents, every house has to breathe. Air needs to flow in and out of crawl spaces and attics. Protecting those vents to prevent embers from getting drawn into those, uh, the, those openings, those enclosed spaces in your house. Probably the second most important thing you can do protecting your home. This is a, this is a photograph here that shows where, where this is really common. My house had this. Somebody's punched a hole to run the cable TV wire through <laughs> into their crawl space. It's the most convenient place. Better than drilling a hole through the wall or at least easier. Um, uh, but they've created an opening into a space to allow embers to flow into it. Lots and lots of homes, most homes have this. This is a quarter inch wire mesh screen, hardware cloth screen. Big openings, it allows a lot of air to flow in and out. It was installed there to keep rodents and raccoons and birds from making their, their nests and homes underneath this house. It was not intended to keep embers from being drawn into that space. We've seen over and over again, thousands, tens of thousands of examples of homes that burned down because embers were drawn through those vents. This is, a, this is a custom manufactured vent that actually custom, it, it's available on the shelf right now at Home Depot and almost every local hardware store in Marin County. This one in particular is called a Vulcan vent. There are three manufacturers in the state of California who are approved to sell vents that are engineered to keep embers from going into those spaces. We've got examples out there uh, on the table you can look at. They're dramatically more expensive than the wire mesh screens, but they're still really a cheap investment. Um, I, I retrofitted my home for less than $300 to put Vulcan vents on the nine foundation vents I had underneath my house. Um, you're, you may have more vents than I do, but, but I, I've yet to see a house where the cost of retrofitting Vulcan vents <laughs> into their vent covers was more than your insurance deductible. Okay? And, and after a fire, you're gonna have a home to go home to if you've installed these and that was your home's vulnerability. This is what it looks like installed. This is also coincidentally a, 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 a house that has not only a Vulcan vent installed <coughs> into its crawl space, but party shingles that look like wood shingles. From a distance of you know, more than about 12 inches, you can't tell visually that these are not wood shingles, right? There's a Vulcan vent installed in the eave of that house. You need to protect any of the vents on your house. Uh, Vulcan Embers Out Brand Guard are the three manufacturers. We've got information about all three on our, our table outside. You need to be thinking about gaps and cracks to just normal maintenance on your home. Any gap in the siding between trim and the siding, between trim and a window, any place an ember can lodge is a potential vulnerability. We, we tend to say that a gap more than about an eighth of an inch is a vulnerability. An ember can become lodged in that space during these fires, during wind-driven fires, especially when wind is blowing on it like a bellows you use to start a fire in your fireplace. Those embers get lodged into those spaces, ignite your home. A $5 tube of cock from Home Depot can seal those gaps. You should have been doing that all along to take care of the house as it was. Not only does it take care of the house, prevent moisture from intruding in the winter, but it can protect your home from embers. Just a simple thing that many people don't think about because they don't know that that's a vulnerability to fires. I think the most important thing, this is the one, these are the things that you can probably correct when you go home, are the normal combustibles, normal things that you chose to store around the outside of your house. We're, we're saying within five feet of your house, might be five, might be six, 10 feet, but within five feet of your house is what we're focusing on based on some science that shows us anything within five feet of your home that ignites is a potential vulnerability. How many of you have a jute fiber doormat at your front door right now? Yeah, and, I, and I bet almost all of them have an oak tray on them. <laughs> uh, uh, that jute fiber doormat is meant to keep the mud off of your shoes in the winter time. They're fantastic. Don't go home and throw it away. Go home. We're, we're in fire season now, uh, 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 amazingly, in the, the month of March. Go home and take that jute fiber doormat. You don't. There's no mud out there, right? It hasn't rained in months. We're done inside. <laughs> Put it on a shelf in the garage. Put it out in the winter time when there's mud on the ground when it's raining. During the summer months, during our fire season months, or even in the winter when we're, we're still in fire season, use a heavy rubber doormat, one of those rubber grates or even a metal grate or no doormat at all. 
the heavy rubber doormats don't ignite during wildfires. This is an ember collector. Embers tend to land on it, ignite, and you've got a bed of dry grass right at your front door. And you'd be surprised at how vulnerable that makes your house, right next to that wooden door. This person had a tile doorstep, invulnerable. Doesn't matter how many embers land on it, it's not gonna burn the house down. And then they chose to put a grass fiber mat right in front of that wooden door. Imagine your surprise at two in the morning when you go to evacuate and you open your front door and there's a burning doormat at your doorsteps. It happens. Wood patio furniture. I, I joke in Marin, and it's probably true most of California, but that this is a real first world problem. The next time you're at, at, at Restoration Hardware choosing a new patio set, the wood furniture is off limits to you. You live in California, you live in Marin County in a place that's vulnerable to wildfires. The only options you have are the metal sets, the cast to iron, cast aluminum. Wood patio furniture is a terrible choice for those of us that live in the path of wildfires. We see it ignite over and over again. Potted plants, too close to the house. Potted plants can be wonderful close to the house. They need to be well irrigated, well maintained. They need to be the right varieties of plants. This is probably a poor choice. Conifers that are planted in a pot right underneath the eaves of your eave of your house. Uh, again, Greg's going to talk to you about choosing natives, choosing the right plants, choose the right color, flowering plants with broad leaves. Make sure they're irrigated. Make sure they're well maintained. Don't put a potted, uh, uh, you know, a conifer underneath the eaves of your house. <sighs> privacy screen. Well, th this is the, the example we've got here. This is a redwood lattice privacy screen on a deck attached to underneath the eave of the house. But how, how, you know, how many times have you seen the, the bamboo uh, shades that people use for privacy on their decks? What might be appropriate for an apartment dweller in San Francisco. It's not appropriate if you live in the wildland urban interface or anywhere near the wildlands in the North Bay or anywhere in California. Stacked firewood. <laughs> this is the other two for I told you. There's a jute fiber doormat on top of the firewood. Uh, this is a house that's got, got a great feature. They have a hardscape path, a, a paved, or a, a, a concrete path for extending six feet out from the side of the house around the entire house. This house has no vulnerability to embers around the base of the house. We'll talk about that more in a second. And then they stack some firewood. It's the middle of summer. This, this picture was taken in, in September. And they, they put their jute fiber door, maybe to get the fiber doormat up off the ground, or, the fire, or maybe to collect embers to ensure that the firewood is <laughs> Terrible choice. Move that inside. Put it in, store the firewood inside. Better yet, you know, most of us aren't burning firewood anymore because there are a few days where we can for air quality. But if you do burn firewood, burn it during the winter when we have permissible burn days. Get rid of it all during the winter. If you need to store it, store it indoors or at least 30 feet 